Well, uh, hi, everybody. I just want to introduce myself. I'm the assistant director here at uh, Florida State's uh, International Programs uh, program in Florence, Italy. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody in the audience today, everybody online uh, from the Bagnesi Palace Alumni Lecture Series. And tonight we're here um, pleased to host at the Florida State University Library in Florence, two of our university's uh, most beloved professors and poets from the English department on the main campus, um, David Kirby and Barbara Hamby. And they have published numerous books, uh, have been longtime instructors at the Florence program. And in fact, Dr. Kirby was an interim director at one point. Um, Zoe, uh, do you'd like to have a few words? Yeah. I will just share something on my screen really quickly. I just want to go over a few ways that you can stay involved with international programs. So if you can see this here, um, there's many ways to support international programs um, as part of this Benyezi Live Lecture Series. We love to have our alumni stay connected with us, and that's really the whole point of doing these um, lectures. So for community engagement and volunteer opportunities, if you're interested in any of that, you can contact us at ip-alumni at fsu.edu. This also includes if you would like to share your story with us, if you're an alumni of the program about your time abroad, please reach out. We love to hear from you and uh, we love to get your photos and all of those types of things. So please reach out to us if you have a story that you would like to share. Um, and then of course, if you would like to give back to international education and give that gift and make those dreams come true, you can make a financial donation. So that would be done through contacting Sarishni Patel in the, at the FSU Foundation. So um, her email is there, it's spatel at foundation.fsu.edu. Um, and now I will stop sharing my screen and we will go right into the lecture. Thank you. And for those of you in the audience, we can get you that information as well um, that uh, Zoe just gave out to those online. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about it, you can uh, talk to me after the lecture series and I'll get you that information. All right. Um, yeah, I'd like to introduce uh, Barbara Hampy and let's go right over there and then um, David Kirby. And I'll let you guys uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Working? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, hello to you. Oh, hello to you. Hello to Flora. Um, we um, it is the most wonderful thing we went to Larry's to uh, the uh, the Kelly when it sounds morbid, but uh, when you're a poet, uh, at least in the Closer. Yeah. Okay. When you're a poet, um, you know, you, you don't have, at least this poet likes to hang around places where poets have been and poets have worked. Because I always think that um, celestial time and mundane time are different. And that the muses might just be hanging around because they don't see, they don't really know that the, um, the big guys have left. And so I might get some rags of their um, instruction. So, it was really, really beautiful. Although I have to say, I wish it was bright and sunny and beautiful. But we have um, a lot of people to thank. And um, uh, I grew up in a big family with showing gratitude was looked down upon. So, but David grew up in a very small family. Can you say who said that? Do you want to say something? I'll be the uh, vice president in charge of gratitude. Okay. Happy, happy to do it. Uh, well, gosh, uh, how they're obvious. We're pretty much uh, in love with and dead. Charlie and Zoe back in, uh, in Tallahassee, and to thank Mira for running uh, the, the center here. And for uh, this is where I segue to the Oscar moment, where I said, so many people to thank. But I'm not going to thank anybody because I'm sure I want to thank my mom and I want to thank my dad. And, um... and uh, yeah, so Shelley's dead, but poetry is uh, eternal. It is indeed. Or Barbara's poetry is eternal. <laughs> uh, well, what we'd like to do is read some poems that um, feature Florence, because uh, we talked a lot, 
And uh, although sometimes the poems aren't really all about Florence, uh, they it, it talks a lot. And also, too, I was an art history, not a major in college, but a minor. And I took a lot of classes in art history. And so coming here was really, really wonderful for me because um, I see something new every time I go into a museum. It's just um, always an amazing experience. And it always opens my mind in, you know, in different ways um, at different times. Sometimes something wonderful will happen, but then something interesting happens. And it's, um, it's just interesting to um, be part of that process and make that into my poetic life. But I wanted to start with a poem that was the title of my first book. And I wrote it after we were uh, teaching here in 1992, probably before a lot of you were born. And um, it was a, a fall semester and it was really um, a, a lot of fun and uh, just a lot of fun. I love fall because it's so warm and then it's cooler and then at the end it's Christmas, which is really beautiful. So the, uh, one of the things when Frank asked us to do this, I started thinking about uh, what to read, and I realized that um, the, the great people in the students really were music, and they came up a lot in my uh, work. Um, I don't want to read the whole poem, but there's um, one, uh, one guy whose name was uh, Merkino, who was a tall, gaunt man, with short torso, he stalked down the boardroom of Croce like a savage medieval prince covered with tattoos. And when he passes me, I leave as I leave our apartment or walk through the market, I feel as if he's pulling the moment and the swirling tornado above his head, lifting me in his face like a magician. So Fabio, my friend I went to learn. Uh, told me that uh, he'd been done time. So this guy was just, um, uh, it was when we were moving over on the Borgo um, della Croce, and it, it was just, uh, you know, you never knew when you were here. And also, something I don't mention in the poem is that it had this huge skeleton belt buckle. So it was just, I mean, he was just as scary as scary could be, but I mean, everybody in the heaven utmost respect. So it was, it was um, he was um, one of the people that became, um, I guess, kind of a muse. But then um, the poem that I wrote that was the title uh, of my first book is called Delirium. 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 And um, I know everybody who comes here knows about John Dahl syndrome. Some people who are uh, looking at um, at this from home, I don't know, but the um, French uh, novelist, um, Marie-Henri Belle, whose pen name is Sandal, came to Florence, and as he left Santa Croce one day, he uh, had this fluttering in his heart, and uh, he didn't think, but he felt like he might think, and he said it was because he had seen so much beauty, and I think all of us knew that when we were in Florence, is one absolutely beautiful thing after another. So this is a poem about my doctor. And I have to say, I think that exhaustion has a lot to do with Or at least it had a lot to do with my experience. Just before I faded in the restaurant that evening, I was telling you a story about a madman I saw earlier in the day as I walked home from my ballet class just off the Piazza Santa Maria del Carmine. And after crossing the bridge of Santa Trinita, looking in at, in at Gin and Dio frescoes for the Sassetti family, then one, uh, wondering how many women there were who were young and rich enough to wear the see through lace cowboy shirts in the Johnny Versace windows on the Via Tornabuoni, at the intersection of the Via de Calzaioli and the Via del Corso, I walked into a hullabaloo being drummed up by a bearded man who was stalking back and forth, screaming something in Italian, of course, and waving his arms in the air. But when he turned, he would reach down with one hand, 
slant his crotch and then pull his body around as though his hips were a bad dog and his genitals a leash he would yank. After each turn, he'd continue stalking and flailing until time to turn again. So I'm trying to explain this in our people. And I saw her bite, but it's too hot. So what do I do but swallow it? But, and it's too hot. And I think it's too hot. And my voice decelerates as if it's in, as if it's a recording of a slowly melting cake. And the scene in the restaurant begins to recede. In the far distance, I see the bearded man ranting on the street, the nearer but receding quickly view in the long corridor of the restaurant. And then it's as if I'm falling into a cavity behind me, one that's always there, though I've learned to ignore it. But I'm falling now first through a riot of red rooms and green, gold, green, blue, and darker until I finally drift into the black room where my mind is. I wake up in the kitchen lying on a wooden bench with you and the waiter staring at me. I'm fine, I say, though it's as if I'm pulling my mind up from a steep wall. The waiter brings me a bowl of soup, which I don't want, but it doesn't matter because the lights go out and a man at the next table says, primo que la señora ed ora la luce, which means first that woman and now the lights. And it's so dark that I can't see myself in you. And I feel as if I'm turning, a mad voice rising from my stomach, crying, where are we anywhere? Wait, and who and what? Why? And I think that's what I love most about travel, is that it makes you ask yourself. You mentioned Santa Cruz, so maybe I'll uh, Say that uh, why would I do this? We do this a lot. We try, we try to do it together. Sometimes she'll go to you know, another school or another venue, and sometimes I will, but uh, you know, life's too short, so we try to play to this together. And almost all the time, it's, it's 90% poetry because we're there to poetry students and poetry programs. But uh, given the nature of uh, I don't know whether there's a 50 50, but we talked about this a little bit earlier. We would like to have a conversation with you and, and celebrate, almost to celebrate Italy uh, through poetry, but, but not necessarily just bond you with poetry. So uh, maybe uh, both in person here and maybe through, uh, we, we could take the comments to chat, can't we, uh, Charlie? Is that what? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if people want to talk about what they what they like about the, um, uh, Italy and Florence in particular, uh, we can have a good time uh, doing that. So we uh, also give relationship advice. We also give relationship advice. Just uh, yeah, if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things are the microphones want to talk to each other. Uh, okay, good. Uh, so this this is a you know. The thing about Santa Croce is uh, all of our points, by the way, are set within a half a mile. We have not all of the points of the lines, but, or the, but we, uh, we, we brought two or three or four each to read, and uh, they're, they're going to be uh, they're, all, they're all set within half a mile of, of uh, where we are. And I tried to figure out earlier uh, how many times we've been to Florence, and I came with eight times uh, teaching, uh, six times since there was a honeymoon, I'm up to 15, but I think it might be one or two more. Uh, yeah, there's anyway, lot, lots of uh, at-bats, and I know a lot, a lot of you live here, a lot of you have been here many times, a lot of you uh, have, a, have fresh eyes uh, and uh, are seeing it for the first time. Uh, and so uh, let's talk about that in a minute. Anyway, when you go into uh, Santa Croce, uh, you, you see people rushing over to see Michelangelo's tomb, you see Rushing over to see Machiavelli's tomb, and, and people rushing over to what they are certain is Dante's tomb, which it isn't. Uh, and I always go and, and uh, uh, if I've forgotten to take my cap off and, and they haven't fussed at me yet, and, and lift my hat to the tomb of uh, Gioacchino Rossini, whose work you may know more about than, than, than he's the guy who wrote Barbara's Hill, uh, Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. He's the guy who wrote uh, William Tell, his famous. 
like video overture and uh, without without him uh you know we would we'd be missing a lot of popular culture because a lot of people have uh, used those tunes in movies and specifically in uh, in classic uh, cartoons so uh this in this poem i'm going to mention uh, some other composers so uh, joseph Haydn, uh, wagner uh, uh but mainly i'm going to mention the many courses of as it says in the title big meal with joaquin Rossini, uh typical italian meal so this is a poem about music and food and friendship uh which leads us to the uh well, the best of everything in life, especially uh, especially right here. So, big meal with Joaquin Rossini. I tell my students not to use words like beauty and truth because first, nobody will know what they mean, and second, nobody cares. They'd much, much rather go on a picnic with somebody and try to make out with them or roast a chicken or have their oil changed and tires rotated than sit around and wonder about whether or not such actions are beautiful or true. Yet, when I am in Florence, Whereas most people hurry to the tomb of Michelangelo in the church of Santa Croce or gather in front of the monument to Galileo, I always bend to knee before the sepulcher of Joaquino Rossini and think, beauty, where would we be without the barber of Seville and William Tell? Why, there'd hardly be any popular culture at all, no Daffy Duck or Tom and Jerry cartoons or Lone Ranger, thanks to this jolly fat man who composed so beautifully, or jolly seeming, I should say. Who knows what joy lurks in a man's heart, fat or not? And the same goes for the heart of a woman, though to comment on a woman's size is something no man would ever do, or at least no gentleman. As for truth, there are two ways to look at it. Think of that James Bond movie in which James Bond is trapped in a hall of mirrors and thus faced with multiple images of the film, so that it is only when he shatters all the mirrors and sees his enemy in the flesh, suggesting that we too are surrounded by distractions which we must eliminate in order to get at the truth, which is imminently get out of it. Then there is the school that says, no. Truth is a rabbit in a briar patch. When you reach in and try to seize it by the neck, you put your hand on the spot where it used to be or will but will be but isn't. So which metaphor do you like? The hall of mirrors, one of the rabbit in the briar patch. Wrong question, since it assumes that truth can only be expressed in words, whereas the truth that springs from Rossini's music is no less true for being inarticulatable any more than a beautiful dinner is less so than for being anything other than itself. Thank you. Joaquin and Rossini, how I'd love to sit down to table with you. Let's start with some antipati misti, then on to the pasta course. Ravioli filled with ricotta and spinach for you, and for me, pettuccine with, pettuccine with ragu. Now for the hard part, which is fish or meat? Okay, meat. We'll have fish next time. One of us should get the veal chop and the other the veal cutlet. Doesn't matter to me. Let's just get both and decide when the plates arrive. Then we're also going to do some side dishes, a plate of fried zucchini flowers, maybe, and artichokes. Saute with garlic and parsley. Okay, now to the essential. What shall we write? Brunello, Barolo, Barbaresco, Nebbiolo, Sagrantino. Why, the very names sound like your lyrics. You like Haydn, don't you? Of course you like Haydn, probably for the same reason Keats did. Keats said that Haydn was like a child, for there's no knowing what he will do next. May we not say the same of your Figaro? Everybody asks for me. Everybody wants me, Figaro sings. Women, children, old people, young ones, and no wonder, I'm the luckiest, it's the truth, ready for anything night and day, I'm always on the move. That's the way, isn't it? Isn't it moving from one thing to another, no matter how big or small the thing, no how long or short the journey? Look, the antipasti. Often you were left in the care of your aging grandmother who had difficulty supervising you, so while your father played his horn and your mother sang, you were left in the care of a butcher and later apprenticed to a blacksmith. No wonder you're at home in the heart of the ordinary uh, people, a uh, heart of a barber, say, or a serving girl. My chop is bigger, your cutlet, and I want you to have it. No, no, I insist. I'm putting my foot down, Rossini. Pass, pass the vegetables, please. One can't judge Wagner's Lohengrin after a first hearing, you say, and I certainly don't intend to hear it a second time. Ha ha, strong passions, Joaquino, strong passions. You say, give me a laundry list, and I'll set it to music. How about a cheese course? Oh, that's right, you're the one who says ice cream, always. Sempre gelato. If every politician had that as his or her campaign, campaign slogan, they'd get elected, and then where would we be? And if you could make a sonata or a cantata or an etude or a scherzo out of a laundry list, think what you could do with this beautiful dinner we're having. I'm glad the restaurant is playing Bellini 
and Donizetti tonight. I bet you'd feel silly if you were listening to your Lady of the Lake or Cinderella. But I just want to say when I listen to those works of my own, I feel more in touch with the times in which they were composed, yet closer to something that's bigger than this world, that's infinite even, that dishes up more love, compassion, excitement, gentleness, more good of every kind than I have already. M music doesn't teach us anything. It teaches us everything. Yes, yes, it's late, but do let's take a gestivo, a digestivo, a grappa, or a sambuca, or both. It can't hurt. Well, it, it can, but who cares? Tomorrow we'll wake up with information and four heads. Well, that's that's the language of uh, language of music, language of food. You know, I was thinking about that guy, the scary guy who's been in prison. I, I tried to talk to him once. He taught me some Italian food type. Didn't, didn't know that. I think probably most Italians. Good guy, probably. Probably not. Yeah, I remember that. That was kind of uh, one. Another thing that I love about Florence is music, and we've been hearing a lot of music here. Um, did anybody go to uh, hear Idui Foscari? With uh, wasn't all I can say is Jonathan Tatelman is the next big, big tenor, isn't he? This, the tenor, uh, and I went to see it because uh, Placido Domingo was uh, singing and I never uh, heard him sing, but I was just blown away by uh, Edelman. This guy had the biggest, he was the other post. Uh, Placido was the father and he was the son. And uh, his voice was just enormous. I mean, that doesn't really describe it, does it? It's, it was just so, monumental. And um, so I've just been playing um, that, that beautiful aria that uh, at the end of Tosca over and over. And then I have another favorite tenor who's Jonas Kalk. So I have a battle between uh, Tatelman and Kalk. And uh, Tatelman is ch uh, Chilean. So that's really uh, interesting. Um, absolutely beautiful experience. And um, I, uh, uh, I think that one of the things that I'd love to talk about is how important I think it is to do things uh, that you don't do very well and how it feeds into things that you might do. And uh, one of the things I love to do and I'm so bad at it is but I really love to draw. And uh, the first uh, drawing class I took was a perspective class that my friend Karen Myers taught here years and years ago, and I just got hooked. And, um, and so I took drawing lessons in, uh, on the Valencia program with Pam White, and then I took um, them in London when we were living there uh, at the National Gallery. and. Um, Penelope, my drawing teacher, told me, she said, uh, you'll get better. <laughs> I thought, thanks, Penelope. And, but, you know, it's true. You do get a little bit better, but not, not that much better. But one of the things that I've drawn so much pleasure from in uh, being in Florence is that I love to go to the barge show and just draw down. It is absolutely one of the most sublime pieces of art ever, and, and, uh, I mean, ever made. And um, I can't re even remember the first time I saw it. I'm sure it was in that art history survey class, but um, little did I know how much I would fall in love with David. I've looked at him so many times. I've drawn him so many times. I have sketchbooks full of him. And it's just a pleasure to go into the Bargello and spend about an hour you know, just um, sketching. And I've um, met a lot of people. And just a tip, uh, you can pick up um, girls and guys there, you know, because uh, everybody likes to sketch. And I've been able to, you know, strike up conversations with many people and, uh, and probably could have taken it farther if uh, David hadn't been in the offing. You know, so, here, but, you know, I'm just a tip, you know, uh, I, but, you know, they'll show you your sketches and who knows what will happen next. But um, one of the things that, um, a, a funny thing happened a couple of weeks 
years ago that is think about actually um, thinking more. You know, I'm starting to think of Mary Shelley and Frankenstein every time that door opens. It's like, spooky. Oh, to drawing Donatello's David again. I'm back in the Bargello drawing Donatello's bronze David, and something's happened in the years I've been drawing him, probably hundreds of more hours putting pen to paper. So my line is not as quavery, and I'm happy to spend an hour or so in this beautiful room with a marble David also by Donatello, and they've moved Verrocchio's bronze David from upstairs. And when my husband is in the room, that's another David, but he's restless and away he goes. So it's just me and my David until a Spanish woman stops me with an anguished face and asks if David is a boy or a girl. And I say, Senora, and point to his penis. But this doesn't solve her problem. And she says, but he's so feminine. And I can't help but agree. But he has, uh, because he has a soft chest and a flowery hat, yet there's Goliath's head under his foot and that big sword he's leaning on. But I've got a drawing to finish and the senor gives up. But soon a cavalcade of fidgety men walk up with their wives or their guidebooks or books that tell them that this is something to look at. And I hear a parade of sneers, snickers, scoops, and see some world-class squirming and a woman and a man get into a heated argument over my guy. And I think, wouldn't Donatello be out of his mind with happiness that after almost 500 years, he's raising a ruckus and I'm making, and making men and women squirm with his beautiful bronze boy. And little did I know when I first saw this statue in art history class, how much in love I would fall, how I would know every detail, the ribbon and flowers on his hat, the crook of his elbow, his hand grasping the vicious sword, the jut of Goliath's nose, his helmet, the blood and tendons oozing from his severed neck, David's tresses cascading over his shoulders. But how can you know when you first see someone how every breath he takes will, will perfume your day and every moment you spend apart will be a night in your heart? But how can we know anything in the beginning except that first kiss, how it knelt at the carapace you've spent years constructing out of books and irony and stray pieces of metal you found on the side? Should I tell the story about Obama's Secret Service, that piece of metal? Uh, yeah, I, I was just thinking about you getting that and kissing. Um, oh, okay, go ahead. You know, we, we know, we know what each other does, but uh, it, it's always kind of a surprise because I was thinking, oh, that's that's the Donatello poem, that's the, the Davide poem, uh, and I forgot that you get around to, uh, which I, I will discuss later. So go ahead and tell your story. Oh, well, uh, I grew up in Hawaii, and uh, we were visiting family at Christmas, and Obama was there, and we were lined up at the restaurant uh, to get into, you know, it in, but the Secret Service started going through my purse and uh, they found this stray piece of metal that I, uh, I do this, I, I love little pieces of old metal. I don't know why, I'm sure that there's some kind of terrible trauma that leads me to do this, but uh, my brother and I had been at our elementary school uh, earlier in the day, Y and I elementary, and I just picked up this little piece of metal and I had, it's, I, I don't, my brother Jeff and I talked about this extensively, what it was. He said he thought it was part of a, a bicycle kickstand and I thought it was part of a jealousy window, who knows? Anyway, I still have it. So uh, um, if you wanna come to my house and look at it and, and put your two cents worth in. But anyway, it was in my purse and the a secret service guy pulled it out and he just looked at me and he said, I'm not even gonna ask. That's my piece of metal story. And that, that was back to Donatello. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for putting that up. Uh, you know, as, as you can see, we, we wander in our conversation and our, our 
forms too, but uh, I hope you begin to get the idea. I, I know poetry is important to a lot of you, and I know for you know, some of you, this might be your first uh, poetry meeting. Let's try to make sure it isn't their last. You know? But anyway, uh, you know, poetry is, is, is nothing more than a way of looking at the world. Probably about the second or third uh, time we were teaching over here, we, we went on a group trip to uh, Venice and uh, we uh, you know, did the Venetian things and, and uh, ate, ate well, drank well, slept deeply at night. And then uh, the day we were leaving, I got up and I walked over to the window and, I, and there was a big man, big man looking out uh, onto uh, the lagoon. And uh, he, he, he was concentrated in a philosophical way. And I was thinking, surely he's thinking of how Venice became a political and commercial power between the 13th and 16th century, or maybe he was hearing the music of uh, Albinone or uh, Vivaldi, or maybe he was thinking of Giorgione or, or uh, Tintoretto or the great Venetian uh, painter. So I just kind of got into his aura and his mood. He was kind of, kind of you know, sort of looked philosophical next to him. And after a while, he noticed me and he said, uh, good day. And I, uh, instantly realized he was either Australian or could do a very good uh, impression of being one. And, and uh, so I said, good day. And, and uh, he said, I'm a plumber. Says, and what interests me is how do they dispose of their solid waste? And uh, I said, well, that's one of the many topics on which I had absolutely no opinion or information whatsoever. But and we talked about some other things. but. But I thought, you know, if you're a plumber, you're going to look at the world like a plumber. If you're, uh, there was a picture of Barbara on Facebook uh, the other day, and she had her, her purse, and uh, a commenter wrote in and said, "Be sure to put your, be sure to put your strap over your, your shoulder and keep your hand on your purse." And uh, I said, "Who said that?" And she said, "That was, that was Mary." And Mary's an ex-cop, so you know, if you're going to look at pictures of people, uh, you know, you're going to look at it like a cop or an ex ex-cop. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so we look at, world, at the world as poets, and as you can probably tell, that just, there's nothing fancy about it or, or obscure. We just uh, like to make connections, and if we're, if we're lucky, we uh, make them in a, in a new and uh, startling way. So, okay, let's review. We've covered art, music, food, uh, crazy people. Pieces of metal. Pieces of metal. Yes, what, what else is, what, what are your favorite? Florentine pastimes. How about you, Hollywood? Back there in the back with the sunglasses. What's what do, what do you like to do in your spare time when you're not writing these blinky with turn papers? Walking around, walking and gawking is the, is the cheapest, the healthiest, and the most uh, rewarding thing. Yeah. Uh, we can, we can quit right now. That's uh, that, the gentleman said the whole thing there. How about you, Michael? What's, uh, you, you're a veteran. You're, you're a battle scarred veteran, all of this. What, is it Chianti or uh, Linguini alla Vongole? I enjoy the Arno, walking up and down the Arno, a lot of people probably don't know it's just a brand new there. Oh, so you head out sometimes to get the, the green stuff. I, I miss that too, I have to say. You know, the, the green stuff. I, I miss that too, I have to say. We, we live in Tallahassee, and some of you are from Tallahassee, and, and uh, others, uh, if you're not, that, that there's no way of mixing up for Tallahassee, with New York, or, or Washington, or, or Philadelphia. It's, it's largely a green city, and uh, I've, I've got to say, uh, yeah, I, I need to, we're going to go back in a few days, like all of you, and we need to get back and, uh, and, and kind of soak up some chlorophyll, I, I guess. Uh, it, it's, it kind of is hard to, hard to. But uh, in, in the spirit of walking around and looking at, at things, I think I might read a poem called uh, Grumpy Old Woman, uh, because uh, keep, keeping true to my promise that all these poems were written within a, a few blocks of where we are right now, um, there's a, uh, a, a restaurant just up the street called Gaston. If you walk up towards the uh, that's a, a San Pierre Maggiore, uh, it, it, it's on the right. You, you probably, whether you've noticed the name or not, it's open uh, out in a lovely place. 
the great thing there's a guy and then Dario who owns owns it and uh, uh, one thing that Barb and I do a lot of is when we we're walking around because first time I I first came here in 1973 and that was a long dark ages long gap and then I, I was 14. Barb. She was 14, and then I met, uh, met Bob, we got married, so we came back in uh, 1982, but then we didn't start really digging in until, uh, until the 90s and the aughts. But one thing we do a lot is, didn't this used to be this, and didn't it used to be that? Well, Gastone, the restaurant, used to be a Forno, used to be a bakery, and there was uh, the grumpiest old woman in the world who sat in the corner of that bakery. And uh, take your money, like everything you did was wrong. Everything was an insult. You overpaid, you were mad, you underpaid. You, if you held out your hand for her to count the way we all do, you know, uh, you know she'd pop your hand and your money would go everywhere. And so I mentioned this to Dario, and I said, This used to be a forno. And he said, See, and he said, that, And there used to be a una, una vecchia arrabbiata in the corner. She said, See, see. And, and we talked a little bit more, and then Dario said, uh, non è una vecchia, a, 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 una vecchia arrabbiata, non è informo. If there's not a grumpy old woman, it's not a bank. So, uh, so I thought, you know, that's, that's something you can take to the bank. Uh, but uh, looking at her and thinking about her and her sisters, who are innumerable, uh, I, I began to wonder what I could do with that in a poetic line. And what I, uh, I guess what I wondered was how, how do you get that way? So I, I did a kind of a time travel or starting her with this point going back. And um, in, the departmental, in the Department of Poetic Wandering, wandering through some uh, uh, different reasons why women might be grumpy, one of which, and, and I know other opinion, this is total objectivity in science, is pregnancy, uh, which of course is pronunciations, right? And uh, one of my great pleasures in walking through the, uh, the Uffizi is looking at all the different pronunciations and seeing the, uh, the angels sort of bobbing and weaving like a, like a prize fighter, trying to get under Mary's guard. And she's, and she's, she's trying to block his shots, right? No, 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 and he and he's, he's I got some news for you. And said, no, I don't want to hear it. Uh, and uh, so I thought maybe uh, uh, maybe some of these uh, uh, grumpy old women and the mother of our savior I have something to come. Grumpy old woman, and there's a little epigraph, that little piece of writing between the title and the poem. Says, grumpy old woman, Florence, or Rome, really anywhere in Italy. She's everywhere in this city. I see her behind the cash register, ironing some guys shirt in a doorway, sweeping the courtyard. She's grumpy already, and if I say, when John wrote to her, she'll look up, scowl, turn grumpier still. I blame her husband, who was grumpy mean to her while he was alive, and then did her the disservice of dying before he could mend his ways or she could take her revenge. Or it could be her children, the ungrateful parasites. Who wants to get pregnant? I know plenty of women, but just as many don't, yet they meet some careless fellow, and there you have it. How I love the angels in the great paintings who tell Mary she is with child, some as pushy as door-to-door -door salesmen, and others contorting their body like bodies like wrestlers trying to get into the guard of a woman who just wants to sit in her garden, read her book, nibble her apricots, and drink her tea without taking on the problems of the whole fucking world. And if Mary looks mildly pissed, there are plenty of other women who are out of their minds with rage. Look at the Judith in Artemisia Gentileschi's painting, cutting off the head of all of Hermes. Girls sawing away as her maidservant caresses the tyrant as though he's just had a mani-pedi and was settling down for a shampoo and a light trim. Judith's mad about something, mad about everything, probably. And who can blame her? For centuries, the church fathers have been telling women they're temptresses, they're bad just for walking down the street, for looking pretty, for smiling, for saying hello, and also for not saying hello. Because either way, they make men mad, they make men, they make men do things that wouldn't be otherwise, women are horrible, they wrong with this world, they blame me, I didn't do it, they did, it's their fault. Men, we can do better. Men, look into the face of your grumpy old woman. Novelist Ursula K. Le Guin tells, tells us that the tired old faces we see in paintings delight us because they show beauty that is not skin deep, but life deep. 
And if that is true for a work of art, how much truer must it be for your Luisa, your Francesca, your Gemma, Gina, Beatrice? You were Adam once, mister. Eve. There was a garden, and there's a snake, sure, but there's always a snake. And here's the road that leads from that garden to this world, which isn't worse, really. It's just different, and you have to work now. But there's something about work that satisfies you deeply. You're making things that people want. And if your boss is a little stern, he smiles at you from time to time. And you sense he sees something in you that you didn't even see in yourself. And like Tommaso and Michele, guys you work with, and nobody likes Andrea, but he's gone now. And if your hours are long, the pay is still good. And when you come home, there she is. And you have your whole lives ahead of you. But we can add grumpy old women to our list, our, our growing list of wonders of uh, Italy. I'm thinking about that. Kind of grumpy. But, but uh, never old, not, not old. It cannot be. Actually, I was thinking when you were reading that about uh, going to Santa Maria Novella on Monday and seeing each fellow's um, frescoes that have been restored and are in the museum now, and that um, beautiful snake in the garden with a woman's head. Oh my God, that is, that's the, um, that's the best snake I've ever seen my entire life. If you haven't seen it, you, you've got to go and see it. And also, too, there's a Last Supper by a woman uh, artist there, uh, Botila Nelli, uh, that was, uh, she was the head of a workshop of painter nuns uh, here in Florence uh, around the time of Savannah. That's uh, always really exciting for me. And there was a big show at the Uffizi, maybe I think three or four years ago with her work in it, and, uh, but you can see it there. At, um, it's been beautifully restored. If you go online and look at the way it was at first, it was just a mess. It had been folded up and, and uh, flowing now. it's really But um, one of the things um, that um, I really love about, about Florence are the, those little cookies and um, they, uh, they have various names, um, biscotti or uh, cantucci. And so uh, one of the um, things that I love about uh, you know, going to see a piece of art is often you come across something that you weren't expecting. And um, that happened one time when I love Pontormo. Um, has everybody been to see the uh, the Pontormo Deposizione at the uh, Santa Felicita? It's so beautiful. It's just one of the most beautiful paintings, and it makes you proud to be a human being. Um, that something like that, uh, and and also too, it could be done by a human being, and also too, kind of a minor, my, maybe kind of crazy uh, human being too. Uh, uh, I love Pontormo. He uh, started off in Andrea del Sarto's uh, workshop, and then he had, as an apprentice, uh, Bronzino. But they were more, they were really more friends because I think there were maybe there was just maybe eight years between them. So uh, one of my favorite stories is um, going to the um, Medici Villa at Poggio a Caiano and seeing this beautiful Pontormo fresco uh, high on the wall. And when he was doing it for the Medici. He, um, he just had a, he had a breakdown and he just said, I can't do it. I need my Bronzino. They said, what are you talking about? And he, said, they, he said, bring me my Bronzino. And the Medici came and they said, okay. And they brought him his Bronzino and he finished it. And thank God, because it's so, so, so beautiful. But um, that's not the painting I want to talk about, but um, the... Um, Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, we were in um, Carmignano because the um, uh, Pontormo's visitation was there. Now, it, we uh, 
we had to hire a guide who had a car to take us there because the you know you have to take about 16 buses to get there and it takes all day so i just said okay i'm just gonna um regard a, a guide and so she took us there and then the next two years um it was in uh, it was in florence once at the pt collison show and the next time it, it was um at the strozzi at the big uh, bill, bill viola show but um with the first time i saw it it had just been restored and it was absolutely beautiful and um so this is about that, uh, about that experience, and then also something else that happened. Um, ode on girlfriends, the brain, and those little cookies you put behind. Contorno's visitation is in a village church at Carmignano, a town near Florence. And once we turn the lights on, one of the most luminous paintings in the pantheon of color appears. And in front and center are Mary and St. Elizabeth, both pregnant with sons who will stir up no end of trouble, though they don't know that. But there are two other women our historians have been arguing about for 450 years. Who are they? I know, they're girlfriends, someone you can chat with, talk over what you're going to do later, maybe go out and eat, then get to the dance, because no one wants to go out alone, sitting in a cafe with your own thoughts, your goddamn consciousness. Which is what? A special firing of synapses in the soft gray sofa of the brain. But we want it to be so much more, something supernatural, a connection with the cosmos. But my new boyfriend, Lucretius, says we already have it, as uh, we are made from the same stuff as the stars. And something that seems so obvious, like the day when I'm sitting in the Brontachi Chapel and seeing the Renaissance be uh, begun by the brush of Misaccio, ugly Tom. Now there's a bit of 15th century trash talk, but what did he care? Because he could paint a guy who would wow Michelangelo, who was hard to impress since he was top dog in a doggy dog world as a student once wrote. But he was sweet too, as when someone complimented his dome on St. Peter's in Rome, saying it was bigger than Brunelleschi's in, uh, in Florence. And Michelangelo replied, bigger, but not more beautiful. And he was right because nothing can compare to traips can compare to traipsing around Florence, the medieval walls of the narrow streets closing in, and suddenly you turn a corner and there's a duomo like a spaceship come to Earth, filled with the aliens created by Montormo, their mat magenta and lime green gowns swirling in the dust of centuries. But I'm in Carmignano without girlfriends, searching for Santucci, the little cookies you dip in Vincento for dessert. But the famous shop is closed because the master baker is sick. But every time we ask, he becomes more and more ill until a man draws his finger across his neck. Then he smiles and says, there's a shop that has even better cantucci. So life goes on. But every time I eat one of those cookies, dipping it in tea or wine. I think of the baker lying on his deathbed, his a life of flour and water and pignoli fading the way the daylight ebbs out of the sky before the darkness comes with a sliver of moon and stars scattered like sugar on the heart of the night. Um, uh, pastries. Pastries. Promoting them to the very top of the list. Um, you know what? I don't know how this happened. We must be having fun, Barbara. It's almost uh, seven o'clock. Maybe I'll uh, uh, get why. But your poems are so wonderful, it's hard to keep count. How many did you read? Can't remember. Uh, okay, maybe somebody else I is counting. Three, so I've read two or something. Okay. okay. But, but first, would fair anybody, is fair. Would anybody like to? Uh, to ask us a question or make a comment or uh, give, give me off a relationship? I was kidding. Better not touch that one. When, nobody uh, wants to get yeah. my relationship advice. Yeah, how about it? Yes, remember, remember the first time I got curious about Florence, all the good faculty there. Actually, started as a green, on the New Year's grass season in 1990, English. David Kirby, uh, one of my professors, 
this Karen from Lowe, who was a famous poet who I heard just returned, he and Barbara Henry just returned from uh, Florex. So he'll do a little article for him, but he's also a very close to the Like, I spent most of my time riding on the shoulders of David at the Piazzale della Signoria. <laughs> and of course, he said it with such confidence and such passion. I believe it, I, I'm pretty sure. The party a few months later I asked Barbara, like, did you really climb up that big statue there and find a shoulder? Roll her eyes. She's like, no. <laughs> no, if, if anything, what he should have been doing is spending his time with Cardell looking at that. The, uh, that's, that's what you learned about the, about the importance of fact checking. <laughs> and also, the, the great thing about poetry is that these things don't have to, uh, don't have to check them. Uh, everybody knows you make it so. Actually, you have um, an ex student who fact checks you all the time, which is I like. Do. Yeah, autism is a beautiful <laughs> thing. Uh, it can be put to good purposes. Uh, I want to, uh, in, in honor of uh, Michael and the gentleman in the, in the back who talked about. Uh, um, you know, beating their feet against the pavement stones and getting around. I, I want to end with a poem that has to do with, with just that, and especially those of you who are, who are undergraduates, uh, you know, the, the, the people who are older, you've already done this, but I, I really want to salute you people for, for being brave enough to do this and tackle a new culture and tackle a new, new language. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, my point in life, every time I uh, turn my phone on, it, it says seven tricks oldsters use to promote longevity, and six of the tricks are always completed, uh, which I, I think uh, is pretty good advice for four year olds and 14 year olds, 40 year olds as well. So, um, uh, Charlie mentioned that I was, I was the academic director here for one term, that was in 2004, and there's a, there's a director director who does ranking and uh, Charlie did, which is to go get you all out of jail and, and uh, uh, you know pay your hospital bills and things like that. So the uh, they were they were between uh, uh, academic directors. So the uh, the, the uh, Jim Pitts, the boss man back in, in Tallahassee, said, "Will, will you be the uh, academic director?" And, and I said, "Sure." What does the academic director have to do? He said, "Nothing." And I said, "You've come to the right guy. I'll, I'll do it." But uh, actually, I didn't do nothing because the best part about it was I got invited to parties and consulates and, uh, and embassies. I, I went to a, a party at the American Embassy uh, once. Barbara and I went and uh, I was talking to a guy in a nice English accent. He said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a poet. How about you? He said, I'm a dude. And, and I said, uh, <laughs> uh, what do you mean like a, like a duke or a player? I said, no, I'm the Duke of Northumberland. And I said, oh, you know. You know Pleasure to meet you, you know. Uh, so, um, but I also met a man. I, I saw a guy. I could, I could just tell that he had a lot of uh, fun uh, in him. And uh, I said, "Sir, are, are you?" Uh, I went up to him. He, he, you know, I could tell he was Italian. I could tell I wasn't. I said, uh, "Are you uh, a man of learning?" And he smiled, the kind of smile, the most beautiful smile. And he said, uh, uh, "He said, I believe myself to be, but my colleagues will tell you otherwise." His name was Mario Monterassi, taught at the university. And uh, we befriended uh, Mario and Millie and, and his wife and uh, would spend time with them. And the first time Mario uh, invited us to the uh, house, he lives in the Piazza, lived in the Piazza della Independenza. He said, be very careful. He said, the two Monterassis on the, uh, that brass doorbell thing that the older Palazzi had. He said, make sure you press the top one, uh, not, not the other one. Said, the other one is my sworn enemy. There's going to be big trouble if you press the wrong button. I said, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and then I forgot all about it. And uh, so uh, I'm actually going to wreck everything because we're having fun. We talked about life and everything. But uh, there's, there was a, uh, a, a tragic moment that I couldn't resist getting into this point because you know, Italy is, is light and fun. And, it's also full of the tragic and the operatic, or else Puccini and Verdi would be out of uh, uh, I don't know whether uh, many of you, if, if any of you have ever seen this wonderful TV series that you can stream called uh, Detective Marco Bono, it's just fabulous, it's just so good. Uh, he's a detective, that's mainly. Uh, 
Uh, and there was, we found to our joy just before we came over that there was um, a, uh, a prequel called The Young Montalban with an actor. And this, uh, that one ended with an event, a uh, terrible, terrible event that happened in Palermo. That's, that's part of this poem, which I'm using here to remind us that uh, you know, life is good, life is bad, life is good. Got to keep moving through it. It's called the Mysteries. My new friend Mario Monterassi has invited me to dinner at his apartment in Piazza Independenza, but has cautioned me to make sure I ring his doorbell, not that of the other Monterassi, who Mario describes as a sworn enemy. But since I've lost the piece of paper with the directions on it, I don't know whether the button for the Monterassi I want is the one at the top or the one just below it. If I get the right Monterassi, I'll have a nice dinner and no doubt. Some of the finest wines known to humanity, whereas the wrong one might lunge at me, crying Turco, Turco, or Turk, Turk, as did the Gonzaga family of Renaissance Mantua, who derided their sworn enemy, even as they took unto themselves his murderous mojo, much as we did with the Native American tribes whom we cheated and slaughtered and made into mascots for our sports teams. So which button do I push? There is a mystery at hand, terrible yet enticing. No wonder the medieval guilds guarded jealously the mysteries of their professions and even called themselves mysteries, which is not so mysterious when you consider that, yes, mystery derives from classical Latin mysterium or mystery, but is also related to medieval Latin mysterium or job, which word is more clearly affected in the Italian mestiere or job, one known even to us monolinguists from French metier or job, which has been translated into English with metier, job. In those days, painters belonged to the guild of the speciali or pharmacists because they used arcane formulas in the making of their pigments. And there were other secrets as well. Vasari wrote that Andrea del Castagno murdered Domenico Veneziano, from whom he learned the art, esoteric art of oil painting out of envy, but he can't have since Domenico Veneziano outlived Andrea by four years. Still, Everybody liked the story. Andrea came from a remote village in the mountains, and there was a wildness in his art that suggests a love of crime. Artists like Paolo Uccello and Piero della Francesca gave him everything instead of perspective. Well, there was nothing new about it. Pliny the Elder claimed, and here you need to remember, folks, that you always give everything at a very early point, that the method of representation known as imagines oblique or slanted images was invented in the 6th century BC by Timon of Cleone, yet Plato condemned perspective as a deceit and the technique was abandoned in the Middle Ages in favor of true proportions. Uh, Paolo Donatello said, this perspective of yours is making you abandon the certain for the uncertain. And Paolo wasn't the only one. In politics, experiments in government led to a breakdown in social order and painting, a flat surface can be made to seem round, just as the earth, which appears flat, is said by the scientists to be round after all. In other words, perspective can mean scientific control of physical space, or simply, that's how I see it, God damn it. I see the whole Magilla as tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral, comical, history, historical, pastoral, tragical, historical, tragical, comical, historical, pastoral, seen in divinable or form unlimited, as the fellow says. In other words, there's more than a single perspective to the word perspective. Often, in the midst of unbeatable sadness, there are moments of strange beauty. After the mafia killed them with a bomb under the bridge leading from the airport to Palermo, for example, the funeral for Judge Falcone and his wife and three of their escorts at which the 23-year-old 23 23-year-old 23 widow of one of the bodyguards, a Rosario Schifani, little more than a girl herself, sobbing for her lost husband as she stands to address the audience, saying, my Vito Schifani, he was so beautiful, and he had such beautiful legs, and then crying out in anger, telling the politicians and officials who crowd the church that they are as guilty as the man who pressed that detonator. I pardon you, but get down on your knees. And then in a torrent of fragments, there's too much blood here. There's no love. There's no love here. There's no love here. There's no love at all. Where is love? 
What is knowledge? Is it that there is no knowledge or is it something more? Standing before the doorbell of Mario and the other Matarasi, I put my finger on the top button, and then the bottom one, and then the top one again. And I turn and I look out at the square where the night has come early with the cold winds that blow down from the Apennines. And a mother shoes her children home, a girl and her younger brother. And a couple passes like the lover in Lampedusa's leopard, perhaps. These be the best years in their lives, but they don't know it. They pursue a future they reckon more than substantial, though it turns out to be more smoke and wind. The last old man folds his newspaper and sits on the bench just a minute more, as cold as it is, as though he can't bear to leave. And then he too goes. And without looking back, I reach behind me and push the first button I touch. And somewhere in the building, there are feet on the stairs. And door opens. That point doesn't really end. <laughs> but we got to do the end. Yeah. What should we do? I think that in, um, we should ask for questions. Anybody have any questions, comments? Say? Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Let's, let's, let's check and see maybe if we have some online let's questions. Check the chat. What we got going on. I'll let you break the computer. <laughs> Joe, do we have any online questions? I'm not seeing anything in the chat at the moment. Just wanted to be sure we didn't lose anybody. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Okay. Thank you so much. Go Nose back in Tallahassee. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.